All right. Here we have chapter five, A Dark Inheritance. Um, Dilasia, if you're watching this and you want to go back through, if you look through the specials um, page, you can find the rest of the chapters for this book. Or if you chat me, I can send you the links because I have them all uploaded on YouTube uh, if you want to get caught up. All right, so let us start chapter five here. Okay. I don't want to screen share my face. I want to screen share the page. Here we go. Okay. Um, hold on. I want to make sure we start at the beginning. Okay. Chapter five. Chapter five. Bench. We left town and headed for the coast road again. Most of the way, I just did as I'd been told. I sat. I rode pillion. I held on to the girl. But as the salt air began to sting my cheeks, I woke up and gained some focus. I had been abducted. Somehow mesmerized onto the scooter. I threw my head around as the memories came back. The tussle with the boys outside the school gates. A beautiful girl with a smooth French accent. The words should somehow put into my head. Oh, pair. I shouted, stop this. Who are you? Where are you taking me? The girl said, Mikel, be still. Her voice ricocheting in the engine drone. I banged a fist twice against her shoulder. She cried out, Hey! and told me to stop. Her elbow jabbed back to keep me at bay. Let me go! I shouted, already looking at the streaking road and wondering how much damage it would do to roll off, even in a floral patterned helmet. I pounded her again. She said something in French under her breath then responded by tying the brakes into a knot and dragging the scooter through a low, tight arc. That answered my question well enough. It hurts like crazy when you fly off a bike. At least she'd had the grace to dump me on the grass. I sat up, clutching my knee. One hand was slightly grazed. My left hip was on fire. I learned an important lesson that day. The prettiest girls can hurt you, and not always in the region of the heart. Take off your helmet. Don't think about running. She gunned the throttle as if she were holding a lion by the collar. And though the accent made her sound cute, there was no mistaking her dark intent. I unstrapped the helmet. Who are you? Why am I here? She tilted her head toward the sea. We'd stopped on the same stretch of land where I'd caught the dog. Like yesterday, it was almost deserted. Apart from the solitary figure of a man sitting on a bench, looking out to sea. Go. He wishes to speak with you. I shook my head. Why? Who is he? Be sensible, Mikel. Don't make me force you. I clenched my fist which only made her sigh. She turned off the scooter's engine and righted her hair with little nips of her fingers. I am trained in four disciplines of the martial arts. I could tie you into a parcel if I wished and drop you on the seat beside him. Go, Mikel. He does not like to be kept waiting. He told me to say he's a friend of your father. It was clear from the unfeeling look in her eyes that she had offered this line as a bargaining tool, a final persuader if all else failed. It had the desired effect. My stomach lurched and I was slightly sick. For three years, I'd waited for a moment like this to meet someone who could help me rekindle the memories of a dad that time was eating away. Now it had happened, and here was the result, a pool of sick on the grass. The girl waited till I'd wiped my mouth. Then she parked the scooter and beckoned me to stand, telling me to leave the helmet on the ground. 
I thought about rushing her, but what were the chances? So I rose to my feet and headed toward the bench. The girl followed, keeping a reasonable distance, crossing her arms like a mother patrolling outside the school gates. I approached the man slowly, coming close enough to hear a fob watch ticking in the pocket of his vest. He was sitting very upright, with his hands on his knees, wearing a crisp black suit. His shoes were patent, also black. Thick flowing layers of pale grey hair were combed back in watermelon lines across his scalp. From the colour of the hair, I thought he might be elderly, but when I saw his face, I realised he couldn't have been more than thirty, if that. His features were sharp, almost highly machined, as if it had been made by a 3D printer. Such beauty, he said, in so much emptiness. He spoke with a high-pitched German accent, a voice that seemed to complement his glacial cheekbones and alabaster skin. He patted the bench. Please, join me, Michael. I wish you no harm. I lowered myself to a sitting position, keeping plenty of space between us. He folded a newspaper onto his lap, last night's edition of the Holton Post. He clasped his hands across my photo, pressing the tips of thumbs together. I noticed he was wearing a silver ring engraved with an image of a black unicorn, the same design the girl had tattooed on her shoulder, memorable not just for its color, but for a loop in the tail that looked like a lowercase letter E. My name is Amadeus Klimt, he said, as if it just read it off a passing cloud. You may call me Mr. Klimt. Please forgive the abrupt manner in which you are brought here. I trust Chantel treated you appropriately. I looked back at the girl, who now had a pretty name to match her fierce beauty. Appropriately was an interesting choice of word. It seemed to imply by any means possible. In their world, that clearly included kidnapping. She said, you knew my father. He raised his chin, letting his pale face bask in the warmth. Yes, your father was a very fine man. He worked for me until he disappeared. Right away he had blown his credibility. Dad had always worked for himself. He had travelled the world demonstrating software for medical equipment. He didn't even have an office, just a spare room at home where he kept his paperwork. How could he possibly have worked for this man? I kept my response as guarded as I could. I don't remember Dad ever mentioning you. I looked again at Chantel, hovering there, bored. I was wary now, thinking they were also journalists, attracted by my freakish rescue of the dog. Mr. Klimt brushed a speck of dirt off his arm. Your father would never have spoken of me, Michael. The organization I represent demands a high level of secrecy. You're from the government? No. I am not. He looked up at a circling gull, tilting his head in admiration as though he'd never seen a bird in flight before. Do you know what a non-temporal event is? A what? I shook my head. He stroked the newspaper, straightening my picture with the back of his hand. I think such an event took place here yesterday, an episode of such unusual proportions that it cannot be explained by normal human mechanisms or environmental conditions. I'm referring, of course, to your adventure with the dog. I'd like to propose an exchange of information. You, describe to me in detail what happened on this clifftop, and in return, I will tell you more about your father. Where is he? I don't know. Is he dead? I don't think so. What do you believe? For the first time he turned and looked at me. He had the strangest eyes I'd ever seen. They were a kind of washed-out purple color set so far back into their shaded sockets they looked like distant stars. It struck me, vaguely, that he could have been blind. He smiled, 
waiting for an answer to his question. I shivered and looked out to sea. I hated thinking back to those awful days when Dad had not come home from his trip. The sleepless nights. The tears. The police. How a man called Mulrooney had eventually come round and talked to us over the lid of his briefcase. How he'd told us there were no reported problems with the flight then, later, no ransom demands for a hostage. No passport had been found. No phone signal detected. Every lead they'd pursued had reached a dead end. Dad had vanished like a warm puff of smoke in the hot desert air. Another missing person. Case unsolved. And as the days rolled into weeks, we knew in our hearts he was never coming back. He was dead. What other explanation could there be? There were rumours suggesting he had deserted us, that he'd forged a new identity and was living a false life like a convict on the run. But I couldn't and wouldn't let myself believe that. This was the man who had read me countless bedtime stories, who'd made me a chain of paper dragons that still gathered dust around my bedpost at night. The man who, on returning from a trip, always stopped on the bottom porch step and kissed Mom, causing her to lift one foot into the air. Why would he betray us or ever let us down? He was gone, and no one knew what had happened to him, least of all this German stranger and his petulant, scooter-riding sidekick. I jumped up and whipped my phone from my pocket. Let me go, or I'm calling the police. Mr. Klimt seemed unconcerned. He studied me as if I were an act on a talent show. All I've got to do is dial 911. Then the boss leaves here with nothing, he said. I mean it. I started moving my thumb. He raised his hand to reason with me. At the same time, a shot rang out, and the man I'd been talking to just seconds before slumped forward on the bench. A trail of blood running down his neck, staining the rim of his collarless shirt. A black car had pulled up not far from Chantel. The barrel of a rifle was pointing through its window. Chantel shouted, Run, Michel, run! Then another shot rang out and she spun around and crumpled to the grass and was still. Two men in dark glasses stepped out of the car. One shouted to the other, Don't mess this up! We want the kid alive! And that was when the strangeness happened again. As the fear welled up and my breathing quickened, the need to escape reached an unstoppable peak in my mind. My senses went crazy and I flashed toward the scooter. The next thing I knew... I was firing the ignition. I heard their shouts, but by then I was away, cutting across the headland toward the group of houses that made up Coxborough Village. I knew there was a narrow lane through to the green that even a small car couldn't have passed down. There would be people there, tourists, gift shops, the pub. I opened the throttle as wide as it would go, praying I wouldn't hit any rabbit holes or stones. I heard wheels spin behind me and knew the car was coming. Within half a minute, there'd be horsepower snorting down my neck. But if they wanted me alive, they were going to have to catch me. The chances were I wouldn't get a bullet in the back. At the entrance to the lane, I heard the squeal of their brakes. A fading horn blast signaled their annoyance. I didn't dare look back. I just kept on going. The gap was tight, but I didn't slow down. Over puddles and potholes I flew. I could see the green opening up in front of me, and I was almost there, clean away, when the scooter hit a mud bump and bucked like a lamb. I fought with the steering, but couldn't stop the front end from pitching against a rough wooden fence. I scraped along, tearing my trousers at the knee, before hitting a clump of privet and finally flying off. The scooter slid into the adjoining road and crashed to a stop against a telephone pole. For the second time that day, I picked myself up from a painful fall. I had scratches on one side of my face from the privet. Other than that, I was sore but okay. I limped into the open. Three people immediately rushed to the scene. One of them, mercy of mercies, was a policeman. Stand back, he ordered. I'll deal with this. He caught me in his arms as I staggered forward. 
Someone call an ambulance. He could be badly hurt. Heck, son, what were you playing at? Murder, I panted. What? He said. On the cliffs, they shot two people. He steadied my face. Who shot two people? These men, black car, they chased me to the lane. He looked hard into my eyes. Are you well enough to show me? I nodded. I think so, yes. Okay, come with me. With an arm around my shoulder, he guided me across to his waiting police car. He strapped me in, then reversed like a race car driver and sped along the road that exited the village and circled back toward the headland. Barely thirty seconds later, I saw the black car. That's it, I said, pointing. That's the car! To my horror, the policeman headed straight for it. What are you doing? I gasped. No, they've got guns! He said, Calm down, Michael. There are no guns. What? How'd you know my name? He tore off a false mustache. That was when I realized I'd met him before. He was Mulrooney, the man who'd come to tell us about Dad's disappearance. We pulled up beside the black car. Mulrooney jumped out and yanked my door wide open. The rear door of the black car also clicked open. Very impressive, Michael, said a voice. Now, please get in before you hurt yourself further. You're exhausted and your power will be weak. I dipped my head and looked into the car. There, in the back seat, was Armadeus Klimt. Chapter 6 Unicorn So, Michael, do we have a deal? The car pulled away smoothly. Klimt pressed a button on the armrest beside him, and a screen came up between us and the driver. Let me remind you, it's really very simple. You explain to me how you rescued the dog, and I give you information about your father. You were dead, I said, still a little freaked out. The bloodstain was right there on his shirt. He laced his fingers, moving his hands like a party clown about to make animal shadows. In my line of business, things are rarely what they seem. What is your business? We will come to that. I tried to look out the window, but the glass was tinted on the inside surface. Whoever these people were, they liked their secrecy. Where's Chantelle? Is she okay? Chantelle has returned to her duties. She will be angry about the scooter. You may have to deal with the consequences of that. Like it was my fault she'd driven me into their charade. Where are you taking me? Home, he said plainly. We are driving you home. How long the journey takes will be entirely dependent upon our discussion. I sighed and looked at the state of my clothing. For the second day running, my uniform was ruined. There was a rip in the sleeve of my jacket, too. Mom was going to go absolutely mental. A year driving around Holton Byford probably wouldn't be long enough to calm her down. I need to be in school. Take me there instead. At school, I could cook up some feeble story that might just scrape under Hamilton's radar and give me time to clean off some dirt. But Klimt quashed that in his very next sentence. Chantelle has already reported your truancy. What? You will be punished, of course, but that may yet have a positive outcome. I slammed back into my seat. Tell her thanks for nothing. You may tell her yourself next time you see her. Next time? Never would be far too soon. This was payback for the scooter, no doubt. Now Mom and Hamilton would both be on my case. How did you know I'd go down the lane? Does everyone in Cockspur work for you? He took a sip of a blue-colored fluid through a straw dipped into a plastic vessel. A slight smell of menthol filled the air. Whatever he was drinking, it wasn't water. Our meeting, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, was staged. I knew you'd be reluctant to share your experience, so I decided to provoke a repeat performance. The guns and the blood were merely illusions designed to test your emotional response to a dangerous situation. 
There were only three ways you could have escaped, left or right along the cliffs, or down the lane to Coxborough. Along the cliffs, you would have been caught by the car. It was a simple matter to position an agent on the far side of the lane in a guise you would quickly submit to and trust. Opening a compartment on the armrest between us, he picked out an orange and a bright white napkin. He placed the napkin over his lap, then proceeded to peel the orange skin onto it. Would you like one, Michael? I shook my head. I didn't do fruit, especially not the messy ones. And for all I knew, it might have been spiked with a truth drug or something. I remember Mulrooney. He came to our house. Mr. Klimt nodded. He and your father were colleagues and friends. On another day, it could have been Mulrooney on that plane to New Mexico. Then I might have been talking to his son instead. You mean you sent Dad on some kind of mission? I watched him put an orange segment onto his tongue taking it in like a lizard would a fly. He swallowed it whole, didn't appear to chew. Your father was not a salesman, Michael. That was also an illusion, a cover to protect the true nature of his work. Of course, you are going to question this, but consider my line of reasoning first. If your father was all you believed him to be, he or his body would have been returned to you. That is the likeliest conclusion if a man goes missing when his sole occupation is selling computer programs to medical establishments. My account brings you a new kind of hope. Hope that he is alive. Hope that you will find him. You may be the only person who can. I looked away, wondering if I might be dreaming. How could Dad have lived a false life and none of us known a thing about it? What did he do? Was he some kind of spy? Yes, in a manner of speaking. He used his abilities to investigate things that did not make sense. Things that go bump in the night, you might say. Are you telling me Dad was a ghost hunter? Klimt flapped a dismissive hand. That would be a minor strand of our work. Unexplained incidents, cryptic occurrences and relative non-temporal events. That is what we investigate. He produced a business card from his jacket and held it between his first two fingers. Hesitantly, I took it from him. The only on it was Unicorn, in embossed silver letters that almost disappeared into the white of the card. Below the name was the image of the rearing black unicorn. I couldn't understand at first why the E had been added to the end of Unicorn, then I worked out that the looping E in the tail of the horse was there for exactly that reason. I also began to see an acronym in the name. Unexplained incidents, cryptic occurrences, even down to the final three letters. What is a relative non-temporal event? I remembered his mentioning this on the bench. He put the remainder of the orange aside and patted his lips with a corner of the napkin. Tell me what happened with the dog. This is your side of the agreement. It does not matter how ridiculous it seems. I have encountered many phenomena in my time. Please, hold nothing back. So I told him what I knew, or what I could remember. Everything from the asthma diagnosis to sensing the husky's thoughts and rescuing it. I spoke for several minutes, and in all that time he never interrupted, as if he had a tape recorder running in his head. Finally, when I was beginning to ramble, he held up a hand to tell me to stop. Was this the first occasion you had experienced such a shift? Shift? What was that supposed to mean? Um, yes, I think so. He synchronized his fingertips and tapped them together. Have you spoken to anyone else about this? I shook my head. What about the journalists? I lifted my shoulders. They asked some questions and took some stuff from my sister's phone, but... Photographs? Yes, but they were useless, blurred. He made a slight humming sound as he traced the angle of his throat with a finger, his purple eyes fixed on the space in front of him. We didn't give permission. 
It does not matter, he said, without moving his gaze. And then he changed the subject. Tell me something. Be as honest as you can. Do you ever think you sense your father's presence? That made me sigh. I rolled my head against my shoulder and tried to look out the window again. So many times since Dad's disappearance, I'd walked past his room, hoping he'd spring out and hug my shoulders. Want to go outside and kick a ball around, Mikey? That was the kind of thing he would say. That was the dad I knew and loved. The dad I remembered. The dad I wanted back. But did I ever sense him? No, not really. I said to Klimt, Why are you asking me this? What's dad got to do with me saving the dog? He picked out his fob watch and checked the time. Please, answer the question, Michael. No, I said irritably. No, I don't feel him. I crossed my arms tight, smothering the need to strike at something. I'd tried so hard to shut all of this out, the aggression I felt toward Dad sometimes, the blame I attached to him for letting us down. How did you get him? Get him? Klimt repeated. How did he come to work for you? What could he do, this Dad I never knew? Klimt tapped a finger against his thigh. It seemed to mesmerize me slightly, like a dripping tap. Your father was a talented software engineer. We heard about him from another source and engaged him to work on a new design project. He was so far ahead of the others in his field that we invited him into our unicorn facility where he agreed to take some tests. We soon discovered a number of remarkable talents. For instance, he could accurately gauge an individual's mood and know with certainty if they were lying or telling the truth. This is a valuable skill to possess, especially when probing accounts of paranormal activity. How? I asked. How did he do it? He was able to detect minute variations in the pigmentation of a person's iris, the circle of the eyes that is colored. He called it flecking. Try it sometime on someone you trust. You think I could tell when people are lying? With training, yes. But that is just the tip of your potential, Michael. I believe you have inherited your father's abilities but taken them to new and higher levels. Do you know what a multiverse is? This sounded like physics, not my best subject. Klimt read my face and smiled. I will explain, he said. Some scientists believe that our world is made up of an infinite number of universes linked so closely that a simple decision, say, choosing to eat an orange or not, might involve our entering a parallel universe and setting off a whole new chain of events. If I eat the orange, for instance, I might spill some of the juice onto my suit. So, I decide to take the suit to be cleaned, and, as I'm crossing the road to the dry cleaner, I'm hit by a bus. Do you see what I'm getting at? None of this happens if you don't eat the orange. Correct. But the possibility that it could happen is always present, somewhere in the multiverse. So... So, imagine you had the power to affect the multiverse, to rearrange its layers to achieve a desired outcome. That would make you... King of the world, I said. A little poetic, but yes. And what if I told you you'd done this twice, as easily as flipping through the pages of a book? I snorted a laugh. Okay, some weird stuff had happened in the last two days. But hopping between universes? That sort of thing only worked in comics. That's crazy! No one can mess with the future. Then we need to continue driving, he said until you are convinced. Meanwhile, there is one thing I can tell you with certainty. What's that? You do not have asthma. Chapter 7 Mission
Okay, that was um, chapter five and chapter six. I hope that you're still enjoying the book. Um, I think that it's going really good. I'm interested in it. Um, to pick up the pace, I am going to try to start doing two chapters at a time and make sure that I post it on Mondays and not later on in the week because on Mondays is your library day. Um, I've just been really busy here at the school, so I'll try and get that together for you guys. Um, I hope that you're all staying safe uh, with COVID and your family staying safe. And we'll listen to chapter seven and eight next week. Thanks. Have a good day.